We're going to detour for a moment to talk a little bit about first and second stage resources here in Mission. Initially, you might wonder how this is connected to what we've been talking about in the previous videos here. But I think if you give it a moment, you'll see how this is connected in two ways. First of all, the principles behind these first and second stage facilities are very much in line with what we've been describing. And second of all, you'll see how they are places where you, even as a layperson or as a first responder, might want to make a connection because they're places where we might be able to uh, refer or support an individual who's struggling with a chronic mental health need. Mission is very lucky to have both a first and a second stage resource in its midst. And even though we're not a very large community, depending on the estimates you read, it's between 36 and 38,000 people living in the Mission area. We are a crossroads, and we always have been. In fact, it goes right back to the very reason Mission was a town in the first place. And so there are a number of people who have been in living a transient lifestyle or who eventually have found their way into Mission that aren't necessarily from this community as a community of origin. And I've actually asked people who were street involved or who were drug and alcohol involved why it was that they had made their way to mission. And one of the answers I received from a number of people was perhaps the most uh, interesting one. And they said, well, mission is a really friendly place. People are welcoming here. People are accepting here. And I have to say that I think this is at the root of why we have both a first and second stage facility and mission. It's not just because we have a need here. There's a similar need in every community. And I'm pausing to reflect on this because I think it is one of the saddest things when I hear business or neighborhood groups rise up to oppose these first and second stage resources. Or we're going to talk about harm reduction in the next slide. slide. The same thing when people propose harm reduction. And we need to remember that if we don't provide options for people to get well, then the social issues arising from untreated uh, mental health issues and untreated drug and alcohol issues continue unabated. And they have a negative impact in many aspects of our community, business being included. So when Mission went ahead and created its first and second stage resources, what we heard from BC Housing, which is the agency that... Um, is responsible for funding these facilities was that they had a unique and very positive experience in terms of dealing with mission both in terms of dealing with the political groups in mission as well as in dealing with the community itself and rather than having people coming to the public hearings with picket signs opposing these facilities they had a remarkably different experience and it was one of my proudest moments as a person in mission to hear people signing petitions to enable this not to oppose this people coming up and truly it was one of the most uh, genuinely rewarding evenings in my career as a city councillor so it's really important for us to understand that these resources are reaching out to our neighbors, they fit within our community culture, and ultimately they are better for all of us. Here in Mission, our first stage facility is called Haven in the Hollow. It's operated by Mission Community Services Society and it's located on Logan Avenue. If you know the Mission area, that is downtown, that is near the Mission Hills Mall, and it is approximately a block off of Lougheed Highway. It is, many people refer to it as a homeless shelter, but it's actually much more than a shelter. People are able to go there for far more than one day, and it used to be that there was a 30-day stay allowed there, and now it's actually up to a 365-day stay. This evolution is a result really of two things. First of all, it was come, there was a review of the procedures that were put in play there, and it came to be understood that some people just weren't ready to move on after 30 days, and that policy of arbitrarily having them leave at the end of 30 days often resulted in people going right back onto the streets. The other thing that's happened that's been a very positive development is that there's just not the same amount of subscription to the facility as there used to be. There's not the same clamoring for the space every night. And so as a result, that means that the people who do need help in mission are being able to get this more exp extended of help and that's a very positive development because it means truly we are putting a dent in this homelessness issue admission I like to call this type of service a gateway service and that's not my word it's a word that's used elsewhere as well and the idea behind it as a first stage facility is that people come into the gateway really with much, not much more reason than needing a warm dry place to sleep and perhaps to get a meal 
But when they come in, they're dealt with in a way that is welcoming, non-judgmental, and dignified. And the people that are there are good receivers. They're good at connecting with people and starting the very basic seeds of relationship. And those people are not only good at that part of the job, but also at referral and connection. And so as they gradually work with people through the stages of change, they can connect people as trust and relationship is built to other services that are a part of their comprehensive wellness plan. That includes getting them connected to a medical doctor. And sometimes these are for short-term sort of acute issues like effect infections and so forth. But they're also for the longer-term uh, chronic conditions, both physical and psychological. They can connect people up to income support or they can connect them to the components that they need to get income support, something like getting a BC identification card or filling out the forms, which for many people is a difficult process, or reading and understanding the procedures that are necessary. Uh, or even giving a person directions or transportation to the income support facility. Um, helping the person to move into community or second stage housing. And we'll talk about second stage housing in a moment. But one of the major aims here is to help a person eventually get back into uh, more substantial housing. That could be a community home, such as returning to their family home, or it could be renting an apartment or basement suite in whatever community the person's most comfortable. And if they can't do that because they have a, a longer term need, perhaps it's a drug and alcohol need, or perhaps they have complex mental health issues, then the person can be helped to transition into the second stage facility, and we'll describe it more in a moment. They also are going to help, be, the, the staff are gonna help that individual to connect to their social assets, back to their family, to their friends, to people in 12-step programs, to sponsors, uh, to any number of other people for, with whom that individual has a feeling of some kind of solidarity, some kind of a healthy social connection. It's also, of course, a place that is simply safe and secure. And if we go back to what we learned with our Maslow chart, our hierarchy of needs, we remember that people who have safety and security are able to move on to some of their higher order needs. So after they've met their food and shelter needs, they then meet their safety and, self, uh, safety and security needs. Now they're starting to be able to think about whether or not they can belong in a particular individual, whether or not they can improve self-esteem, and improve their cognitive abilities. In other words, learn things that will perhaps have a long-term effect on them. But without a secure and safe place to call home, individuals can't do that. And this again is one of the reasons why that 365-day stay is there instead of a 30-day stay. Many people report that being involved in the shelter or in the, I should say, the first stage facility is one of their first opportunities in a long time to have what they call normal relationships, to be connected to somebody other than an active drug user or, or a person who's equally decompensating and going through crisis. And that in and of itself can be quite a relieving experience for an individual to have social relationships that are low stress and that are that just feel good and sometimes they're nothing much more than just fun and friendly. Something as simple as playing a game of crib or watching a television game a television program and talking later on about the hockey game or the show that you watched is really healthy for people. And it's also a holiday from sometimes people's lifestyle. And it's, it gives them a chance to get some respite, get stable, get feeling physically better, and start to unravel some of the stressors in their life. For people who have been using drugs, it can amount to a holiday from drugs, allowing them again to improve their lucidity and be more capable of addressing their mental health needs in a proactive fashion. Our second stage facility is named Rivendell. If you're from Mission, you know that Rivendell is located at what used to be called Grand Street Lodge. It was formerly a, a facility, an extended care facility for seniors, but it was in completely renovated by BC Housing, and it's located across from Centennial Park, or just around the corner from Centennial Park, and St. Andrew's Church. It's also very proximal to the Leisure Center and to Centennial Place Mental Health Clubhouse. And so this is a really nice convergence of services for the people who attend Second Stage Facility because they can go and access the uh, play program, which is a low-cost leisure access card program. They can meet people in their community. They can attend 12-step or worship services at places like St. Andrews. And they can get a lot of psychosocial, including things like work services, through community from Centennial Place. 
even the park itself is a nice amenity for people to be able to get out, spend some time outside, and, and just have a respite from all of the social activity that comes from living in a congregated care facility. So this is similar to an assisted living facility that you might find for seniors, where people have their own private space, but where they share some meals and some activities together. The person can live in this facility for up to 48 months, and they have an apartment type unit, which each unit has a, a basically a bedroom and a bathroom, but it does not have its own kitchen. There's a shared kitchen, and one meal is provided by the facility every day, and the other meals are prepared by the individuals in the kitchen uh, as they would like. There are group sessions offered, for example, drug and alcohol programs sessions, as well as life skill sessions, job search skill sessions, and so forth for people to participate in. It is focused on drug and alcohol, and sometimes I hear people refer to it as a drug and alcohol rehabilitation facility, but it's not a drug rehab facility. Other mental health supports are provided there. Other mental illness needs are supported there. So a person that goes into that particular facility may or may not have a drug or alcohol problem, but if they do have a drug or alcohol problem, it's very likely that it's a concurrent disorder. In other words, they have that disorder as well as some other mental health issue, and that's part of why their needs can sometimes be more complex. There is, as we said earlier, a connection between Rivendell and other community services. So because this same facility is also run, run by Mission Community Services, there is a strong interconnection with the staff from Haven in the Hollow. Sometimes they're the same staff working in more than one of the locations. But they're also connected to all of the other services that are operated by Mission Community Services, by Fraser Health, by groups like the Women's Resource Society of the Fraser Valley, by the District of Mission, by the school district, by faith groups, you name it, these people are connected to it. It's part of their job to know what's going on in the community and help connect consumers to it. And so, if you don't know exactly where to find a service, a phone call to these people is a good way to get the ball rolling. And their aim is to transition the individual to the community. And one of the things that's somewhat lacking in the service, and I personally would like to see evolve, is more of a transitional role for people who are moving out of the facility into their own apartment. And that means that they're going to be, there is a suite in the bottom of Rivendell that is designed for people to have essentially a practice apartment and for them to literally try it on their own for a few months before they move out into their own setting. But it's also important for there to be an outreach work worker who goes out and connects to the landlord. At this point, that's done informally by the Rivendell staff, who will try and make a connection with a, a landlord and, and provide some form of resource in terms of giving that landlord a person to call if they have questions or concerns. But it's important for us to work towards a third stage type of approach, which is to have strong transition for people who are living in community and for us to uh, support those community living placements. Another word we want to talk about or expression we want to talk about is harm reduction. I'm sure you've heard the term in the news. We're going to look in a moment at a link at the International Harm Reduction Association. It's a simple two-page PDF document and I cannot strongly enough urge you to follow up this link and print it off. We're going to click to it in just a moment so that you can see it here. But it is so worth having and understanding what it, what it means to be involved in harm reduction. So this, uh, there are a number of principles that are associated with harm reduction and we're going to look at the handout and you'll see that it is a principle-based approach. It's also an evidence-supported approach. So it's not just touchy-feely, it doesn't just feel good to do it. The proof is in the pudding that in fact programs like the Insight Drug Program in downtown Eastside Vancouver have proven to be effective at helping to reduce the amount of drug and alcohol addiction in that community. The approach that is taken is an incremental approach. It's what we've essentially talked about when we've spoken of taking a stages of change approach. Working with people at their rate, at their pace, where they're comfortable and gradually expanding the amount that we do with the person rather than trying to force, in, force them into a one-size-fits-all system. And at the root of harm reduction is the idea of dignity. And that's part of the reason why it works, because it's a response to the message that we hear from consumers that they don't like to receive care 
because coming in and receiving care is an experience that is so hard on their dignity. And I want us to pause for a moment and imagine how difficult it is for us just to go and see our family physician or just to go into the hospital for surgery. It's already difficult to get past the idea that there might be something wrong with our bodies. When we have to also enco- encount- uh, sorry, sometimes countenance the idea that we're also going to go in and potentially lose our freedoms, lose our ability to express our opinions or choices, or potentially have things done to us that are highly stigmatized, we are very, very likely to not go and get that care. And so harm reduction takes the approach that we need to address people's dignity, their emotional comfort with the processes they're undergoing, because without that component, we're going to make absolutely no progress. So here's the link to the International Harm Reduction Association fact sheet. It's just two pages, as I said, and it's an extremely informative two pages. I want to quickly skip down to the principles portion of this. You can see that the first principle is that they target risks and harms for people. So they are not taking a global approach and just trying to get everybody. They're trying to address the specific issues in a particular area and a particular uh, population. The approach is evidence-based and it's proven to be most cost-effective. It's incremental, as we said, so that we're making small changes for people towards any type of positive progress for an individual. It involves dignity and compassion. It applies to uh, applying the uh, human rights of all people to the individuals that are consumers. And understanding that just because a person is struggling with drugs, alcohol, or mental health issue doesn't mean that they have lost their sense of self. One of the ideas is that we need to challenge practices in many cases that are extremely long-standing. And that's exactly what we're aiming to do with this program as well. We understand that the practices that have been employed were well-meant. But we also understand that in many cases they were not reviewed in terms of their, uh, their effect- efficacy, in terms of their cost effectiveness. And we've made assumptions for a very long time that our approaches were working. When, when we look at them more closely, the evidence is clear that they haven't. We also want to make sure that any approaches that we have, especially because they constitute a change in mindset, involve transparency, accountability, and participation by the public. We want people to understand that it's not something that's hidden away from them and not something we need to be afraid of. And so I strongly encourage you to read this document and to be uh, a voice of reason when you hear people speaking about harm reduction because harm reduction services actually do make a huge difference for individuals. And let me tell you, I had to be convinced of this myself. So I speak from experience when I say that it can be difficult to change our minds. I myself had to change my mind. But now that I have seen the research, I have become a major proponent of the idea of harm reduction. All right, it's time for another one of those dreaded journal entries. We've had you look at the International Harm Reduction Association website. We'll leave that link for you. We'll also get you to go to the BC Housing website, and that link will be up. When you go to the BC Housing website, we want you to click around and identify the different types of housing that are operated and the different service providers and the different communities. If you're not from Mission, find the community that's closest to you and see what they're offering. See if you can find out what their models or principles are in the places that they're operating. What are the policies? What are the referral rules and that sort of thing? And you may have to continue on from the BC Housing website to links for the actual service providers. After you've done that work, answer these questions in the journal. What did you learn about harm reduction and first and second stage facilities? And how, if at all, did this lesson affect your perception of homelessness and other housing initiatives?